Psalms 22, 23, and 24 all talk about uh, the great shepherd or the shepherd. They're all three prophetic psalms. Psalms 23 talks about the death of Christ on the cross. And what's interesting is Psalms 23 was written some thousand years before the Romans ever invented crucifixion. And yet as you read Psalms 23, you can't help but obviously see the crucifixion in it and the description of the crucifixion. If you've never looked at that, I encourage you to go back and read Psalms 23. But Psalms, excuse me, Psalms 22. But Psalm 23 is prophetic of whom John calls in the New Testament, the good shepherd. So Psalm 22 is about the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus speaking, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's what a good shepherd does, lays his life down. And we see that in Psalms 22. So that's the psalm about the good shepherd. Psalms 23, the psalm that we'll be looking at this morning, is about the great shepherd. And that's about Christ working in our life today and changing us and molding us into his image and working in our lives. The writer of Hebrews prophetically wrote or, or wrote of this great shepherd by saying this, Hebrews 13, 20 to 21 he says, now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd, speaking of Christ, of the sheep, through the blood of the, the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, and here's the key, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will. God wants to equip us in every good thing to do his will. That's what the great shepherd does, working in us that which is pleasing in the sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And then finally, Psalms 24 is about the chief shepherd, and it speaks of the coming of Christ. And in Peter, Peter refers to the great shepherd when he's talking to other fellow pastors, and he says, be sure to manage the flock carefully and pastor them carefully, knowing, verse 4, that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. And so we see that in Psalms 24. But we're just going to focus on this Psalms 23. And by the way, Psalms 22, you could put it in a nutshell and say, Psalms 22 is about when we accept Christ. Psalms 24 is about when we go to be with Christ one day. Psalms 23 is about what happens right now. I believe there's some of us in this room today that, um, and I'll throw myself into this. There's times I struggle to let God be the great shepherd of my life. I could be that rebellious sheep. I know God wants an area of my life or wants to have victory in an area of my life. And I just, Lord, I just don't want to give it to you right now. And God kind of puts you in your pen. He goes, okay, well, stay there and suffer through it. And when you're ready to give it up to me, I'll take it and I'll make it better. And, and we all go through that as believers, right? We all have those areas of our life. That's part of the daily uh, or the life struggle that we have as believers. But then some of us in the room, I believe, Maybe you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you look back and you go, I've been following Christ for two, three years now. I asked him in, and I don't see any changes in my life. And there's people around me that have accepted the Lord. I see them in church, and their hands are raised during worship, and they love to worship God, and they just seem like God is, man, they were doing drugs before, and now they've overcome, and they're not doing drugs anymore, and they're just so happy all the time. And why are they so different? I'll tell you the answer. The answer is because they've submitted themselves to, as Christ being their shepherd. They've allowed Christ to be the shepherd of their life. As you submit yourself to Christ being your shepherd, God will make that change in your life. And we want to look at that today. Psalms chapter 23, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. And by the way, I, I, um, when pastor asked me to teach this coming Sunday. He's in, if you don't know, I'm not the senior pastor. Pastor Jim is in Israel this week. He asked me to fill in for him. Um, when he asked me to teach, I immediately thought of this psalm. I thought this is what I want to teach on because LV and I are going through some struggles in our, in our lives. And um, we have friends in the church that are also going through struggles. And it was just, it's close to my heart. And more than anything, I felt like I needed to do this for me. I needed to recalibrate. I needed to make sure that I was submitting to the Lord as my great shepherd daily, even now. Especially now, because we're going through some trials. 
And so when I opened up Psalms 23, when I think of Psalms 23, I think of the last three verses. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, right? This is where my mind's at. And as I studied it, I quickly realized that, no, Psalms 23, the first three verses are about my life in Christ as a whole and the work that he's doing in my life. And the last three verses talk about that time of my life when I go through various trials. And so um, I'm just thrilled to be up here and I'm thrilled that God has put this message out here for, if anybody else, for me alone. And I hope you're blessed with it as well. But Psalms 23, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 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 So, I divided this psalm into two sections. The first three verses talking about our life as a whole in Christ and what that should look like and how God wants us to submit to him as our shepherd and how he wants to change us. And then the bottom three verses kind of take this parenthetical look of when we go through trials. And so that's how we're dividing it up. I've entitled the first half of this psalm, Our Shepherd Who Leads Us. I'm sorry, I'm not that creative. I mean, that's I, anyone could have come up with that, right? Our shepherd who leads us. But the first thing that I want us to know about this shepherd who leads us is that he meets my needs. Psalms chapter 23, verses 1 and 2 says this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. You see, when Christ is my shepherd... I will not want. How do I know if I'm submitting to Christ currently as my shepherd? Well, one way I know is I won't have all of these wants in my life, these, these desires that overtake me, right? I'll be satisfied with him. And interesting that David is not saying that, what he's not saying here is that God is some genie in the sky that just gives him everything he wants. If he did that, I've had, I'd have a challenger sitting in the parking lot. Um, <laughs> If the Lord thinks I need a challenger and he thinks I'd be blessed by it, then bring it on. But right now I don't have one. Uh, so David's not saying God's just going to give him all of his wants. That's not what he's saying. But he says, as I submit to the chief shepherd or the good shepherd, rather, the great shepherd in this chapter, as I submit to the great shepherd, I'm just satisfied. I don't need anything else. What else do I need in life? He makes us content. My wife and I, we took financial peace here at the church, and I'll tell you, prior to doing that, we had already started plugging away at our finances, uh, our debt, I'll say. And um, we were plugging away at it, and then financial peace came to the church, and we thought, oh, let's take that. And we just, when we finally aligned ourselves with the way God wanted us to manage our finances, all the desires and the wants went away. Yeah. When we were in debt, man, there were all kinds of things that I wanted in life. I mean, I, I really wanted that challenger then. Now that we've gotten out of debt, I don't want to go back into debt. I don't need that challenger that bad, you know. So God got us out of debt. We praise him for that. But we got our life aligned with what the Lord would have us do. Paul gave this example in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And by the way, Paul writes this from a prison cell. Keep that in mind. Paul says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and being hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. If you'll leave that verse up there just for a moment, notice he says, from prison, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. The word and in the Greek can also be translated as even. So what Paul could be saying here is, I've learned the secret of being filled even while going hungry. I've learned the secret of having abundance even while I'm suffering need. Paul says, I'm just satisfied. He's my, he's my shepherd, I submit to him. And when Christ is my shepherd, I have peace. Did you know that a sheep 
will not lay down and rest if he's nervous. If there's dogs around, if there's danger around, they're going to stand and they won't sit down and rest. In order to get a sheep to, to lay down and rest, you have to get them into a peaceful environment. And so here David says, my shepherd, he leads me beside quiet waters. Or excuse me, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. That's what our great shepherd does is he meets our needs. In Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew writes and he says, he's, he's uh, commenting on what Jesus says. Jesus says this. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor do they reap and gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you of not much more value than they? And who of you being worried can add one single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what... What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Think about that. The heavenly Father knows that you need all these things already. And here's the key. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Submit to the great shepherd and all these things will be added to you. So he meets our needs. He's more than capable of doing that. The second thing that we want to look at when it comes to um, allowing our great shepherd to lead us is that he changes me from the inside out. In Psalms 23, verse 3, it says, He restores my soul. Now think about that. He restores it. My soul, it's my mind, my will, my intellect. It's my emotions. It's the way that I think. It's my personality. It's the thing that makes me who I am as a person. He takes my soul and he restores it. How many of you need your soul restored, made better than it's ever been before? That's what he does. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Bible teaches us, and we learn from the Bible, that we're made up of body or flesh, soul, and spirit. So on one hand, I have my flesh, and prior to knowing Christ, I lived in the flesh. And... I accept the Lord when I was four, so I wasn't quite that ornery. Some of you accept the Lord much later in life, and let's just say you were a lot ornerier than I was. So you were living in the flesh, and as you're living in the flesh, and, and you're doing things that uh, are not spiritually minded, that tends to shape your soul. It shapes your personality. It forms you into the individual that you are. But the moment that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior... He didn't take control of your soul. He took control of your spirit. And your spirit came alive. And as you read, as you pray, as you come to church, as you worship, as you get to know one another and you fellowship with one another and you dig into God's word, as you submit to him as the great shepherd, as your spirit comes alive and begins to take possession of your soul, it's trying to possess your soul. The spirit is. It wants control of your personality, of your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. On the same hand, you have this battle going on because the flesh doesn't give up. The flesh is still there, right? Battling for your soul. And so as a believer, we have two forces battling all the time. We have our flesh and the things of the flesh constantly trying to shape who we are. And we have the Holy Spirit that's alive and connected with our spirit, trying to take possession of our soul and the way we think, the way we react to life, the way we respond. And so as we submit to the Lord, he'll change and he'll mold us. In the scripture, there's two words that talk about this process. And the first word is justification. The Bible says that we're justified. The word justified means to declare righteous. If you were a criminal, let's say you were a thief and you were serving a prison sentence of five years, and you spent all five years in prison when you got out, the judge would hand you a piece of paper, uh, and on it, it would declare you justified. You've met the requirement of the law. You've served your five-year prison sentence. You're free to go. You're justified. That criminal takes that piece of paper, that thief, he takes that piece of paper and he goes, I'm justified by the law. 
But am I still a thief? Likely so. I'm probably going to go out and steal again because nothing changed on the inside yet, but yet I'm declared righteous. I still hold a piece of paper saying I'm declared righteous. Jesus, when he came and he died on the cross, he was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And when he shed his blood on the cross, he and he alone now is able to justify us, to declare us righteous. Regardless of what you do, God declares you righteous. If you've asked Jesus to come into your life, the day that I asked Jesus to come into my life, Christ's blood washed over my soul, washed over me, and declared me righteous. And there's nothing I can do to ever break that. God declares me righteous. But you might say, David, I don't feel righteous. I still continue to sin. I still continue to do wrong things. I still have that area of my life I just can't seem to get victory over. And I'd say to you, if you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, God has declared you righteous. He's given you the piece of paper that says your debt has been paid in full, past, present, and future. He's paid your, he's paid your penalty. But now comes a process of sanctification. And the word sanctification means to make holy. It's the process that we're all going through right now. If you're a believer, you're in the process of sanctification where God is changing you into his image. I spared no expense and I went to the dollar store yesterday and I bought this uh, puzzle. It's a 48 piece puzzle. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it's a rabbit. And when you look at this, this can really symbolize for us what justification is. Because when God looks at me, he sees me as a completed project. He sees me as the rabbit, as the whole completed project. He sees the blood of Jesus. He sees me in my perfection. That's the way he chooses to see me. He doesn't see all the brokenness of my life. He chooses not to look at that when he looks at me. He declares me righteous. He justifies me. But I open up my life and I look in and I say, but God, the pieces of my life are overwhelming. And I look at the pieces of my life and I say I'm broken. And this is where God stoops down in life. And he stoops down to us. He came to earth. He died for our sins so that he could sanctify us. And he begins to pick up the pieces of my life. And he begins to fit these pieces together. And that, well, look at that. It's a fit. Imagine that. Um, he begins to put these pieces together of my life. And that sanctification and that process is going to happen until I go be with them. And he's not upset if I'm a 48-piece puzzle or a 5,000-piece puzzle. He loves puzzles, and he's going to put your life together. And so if you're here and you've been struggling because you've accepted Christ, but you look and you go, man, my life is just messed up. That's okay. All of our lives are messed up. You're in good company. Just continue to submit to him as your shepherd. Allow him to do the work. Just patiently allow Christ to come in and to do this work into your life so that he can change you from the inside out and he promises to do that and you're going to see your life change as well the second half of this chapter the last three verses are where the psalmist takes this parenthetical look of of trials in our life and I've entitled it the shepherd is always with us because I think that's important but before we talk about trials I really want to be sensitive here because I could get up here and whimsically talk about trials and act like, oh, God's got it. And, you know, just trust him. And, and you might be really going through a painful trial in your life, something that is heavy. And you could think that, um, well, let's just say James says this, count it all joy when you go through various trials. The word various, it means different colors and different sorts. We're all going through various trials of some sort. And if you're not going through a trial today, God bless you. But hold on, because they're coming. I mean, we're all going to go through trials. Whether you know Christ here or whether you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, difficulties in life just happen. Having Christ as your Lord and Savior doesn't make you exempt from difficulties in life. I used to go out witnessing on the streets, and one of my favorite things to tell people, because I thought I'm just going to hook them in, get them accepted, Except, as I'd say, just accept Christ and all your problems are going to go away. <laughs> and that's probably the worst thing I could ever say to him because your problems don't go away. But the difference is Christ is there with you as a Christian. He walks you through your problems. Um, so different shapes and sizes of trials. You may be, and by the way, regardless of what type of trial you're going through, they're all difficult. 
If it wasn't difficult, it wouldn't be a trial. It wouldn't be a, you know, they're all difficult. But some of you might be going through a trial of financial nature, or you've lost your job, or a relationship issue, or something going on with your children, or things aren't going right at work, and it just has you overwhelmed, and it's a difficult time. This applies to you. But you might be going through the loss of a close loved one, or you're dealing with the sickness that has the potential to take your life. Those are heavy trials. And there are no easy answers to the trials. There's nothing that I can come up here and say, man, if you just follow these things, God's going to fix it. There's no promise of that. But there is the promise that God will never leave me nor forsake me. He'll walk me through every trial and he brings me peace through the trial. And so that's really the promise that we have. You know, as we go through the trials, what I find interesting is that Satan oftentimes tries to lie to us. And if you're going through a trial, I hope you're not feeling this way, but I felt this way when I've gone through some difficult times. I felt unworthy. I felt like I brought it on myself. And maybe you did. Sometimes we do that. We can make our own bed and we got to sleep in it a while. Um, but not always. Um, maybe you feel broken. Maybe you feel like, how could God ever use me? He didn't even want to use me. I mean, look at my life. Look at what I'm going through. How could God ever use this? And so Satan will come in and he'll tell us. And by the way, that's a lie. And we need to recognize that as a lie. My wife and I, we've been going through a, a trial now for quite a few years. We've been plugging along and just going through it. My wife's health, she's got some health issues, and I'm not going to go into all the health issues that she has, but suffice it to say, she has a lot of doctors, and she has to see those doctors on a monthly schedule oftentimes, and they all have a little piece of the puzzle they're trying to fit together, and, and it just feels like this trial just goes on and on, and all through, through it all, my wife just continues to trust God. Is it discouraging? Of course it's discouraging. Who wants to go through a trial? But... She gets into God's word and she prays and she puts on the worship music and she trusts that God is in control of it. And um, by the way, I asked her if I could share this. She says I can. Um, she's a little bit more of a close. She's a closed book and I'm an open book. Um, if you, we went out and had a cup of coffee, I'm just bound to tell you something personal about my life. <laughs> and my wife hates that. She really hates that. I just relate to people that way, you know. I want you to know my sorrows. And... Um, <laughs> My wife, much, much the opposite. But God's been doing a work in her. And if you follow her on Facebook, you'll know that she shared some of her stories and her struggles and how she's continuing to trust God. You could see that. And the women come and they'll say how blessed they are because they see that she's trusting God through it. And it's an encouragement to them. But anyways, about eight months ago, I'll share this part of it. She says I can. About eight months ago, we were leaving a conference and she was driving home separate. I was actually already at work. She was driving home from Huntington Beach. And she had what later the doctor said was a TIA, which is a mini stroke, um, coupled with SVT, which is a heart arrhythmia. Her heart started racing about 180 beats a minute um, and beating irregularly. And then the confusion of the stroke and not knowing where she was. But Man, God was in the middle of it. She had the sense to pull over. She walked into a firestone with her phone in hand and said, can you call 911? Something's wrong, you know? And, and then she called me on the phone immediately. And I praise God because I picked up. I was walking into a lunch meeting. And what's more important than eating? And, um, but I picked up. And thank God I did. It was her. And, and so I quickly got to the hospital. I think I got there right after the ambulance did. And we even in that, we saw God working. And for eight months now the doctors have been trying to the sort find the source of the TIA and the SVT she's had a lot more um, of the SVTs happen over the course of these eight months and um, it's just something that we're dealing with and one of the tests that they did was an EEG about two months ago and we go in for the results and the neurologist says well we saw a slowing of the right side of your brain and we you know that's indicative of possible seizure activity and so we're going to have to do some more tests and see if they're seizures. And so what you've been having possibly could be seizures. Um, but with that, I'm sorry to say I need to take your driver's license away. So they took her driver's license away that day. And that day she called her boss. She's a nanny and says, I'm sorry, I can't come to work tomorrow. So she lost her job the same day. We had a wedding just two weeks 
uh, or two months ahead of that and we were already going to be short the funds for the wedding we didn't know how the funds were going to come in we thought we were going to have to borrow from Aubrey and Charlie and and we were struggling with that we didn't want to borrow from them God's got us out of debt we believed he was gonna we really felt like God was going to get this wedding paid for before the wedding came and that seemed to kind of spoil those plans but we begin to we just continue to trust God but I don't want to mix it and my wife wouldn't mix it you know keeping it real there were times of struggles I mean she'd wake up at two in the morning with just these negative thoughts of what if you have another stroke or or these problems are never going to go away you're in this trial forever and just Satan would come in and lie to her and she'd be discouraged and I'd wake up and she'd have her Bible open reading and praying and the worship music going and it would refocus her and she'd get focused again and but it wasn't without a struggle I mean I don't want you to think she's like this perfect you're perfect sweetheart <laughs> but she struggles just like you struggle in a problem right I mean it's there but she keeps recentering herself on Christ and she and she's got this testimony in her life and so one day I walked in it was in the afternoon and she's crying on the bed and I said honey what's wrong and she says you know I know I know God is going to get the glory through this trial when it's over. And I know he has a purpose for all of it. I just wish I could see it. And God spoke to me and I said, honey, you are in the middle of God's purpose right now. God is working his purpose out in you right now. You're in the very center of his will. God is being glorified right now. Look at how God is ministering to other women. And yes, the trial is long and we don't even have an end in sight now. I mean, we're just, we're in it, right? And so we don't know when it's gonna ever come to an end, but we know that God is with her. And the fact that we know that God is working his will and his purpose out in her life, we know that she's in the very center of God's hands. She's not outside of God's will. She's in the center of God's will. How could she not be in the center of God's will? And he's working his purpose out in her and he's ministering to people through her. And so for that, we give, the God, we give God glory. I got to tell you something else that's so amazing with this. Because the week that she lost her job, I think it was that same week, maybe the following week, an opportunity came up with a company for her to uh, help them catch up on some stuff through a temporary job. It paid more than her nanny job. And if you ask me how much more, I'll just say the wedding is paid off. And it was paid off the week of the wedding, so we're blessed for that. We're broke, but we're not in debt. That's a good thing. So, um, But anyways, God is just, he's through it. We, He's never left our side. He's always been through it. And is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult. If you're going through trials, I know it's difficult. But he's there with you. And he's going to walk you through it. There's three things that we learn about the trial. Psalms 23, verse, uh, verse 4. Uh, the first half of verse 4 says this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Notice, uh, and the first thing I want you to see from this is that trials will come. Notice that the psalmist doesn't say, if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's a normal thing for a believer to go through valleys in our life. And so we're not exempt from it. There's a passage. I love this passage. I'm sorry. If you've heard me preach, you've definitely heard me share this passage because I just love the story. Mark chapter 4, there's this story where Jesus is preaching on the seas of the shore of the shore of Galilee. And he tells his disciples, we need to go to the other side. And I don't know that he told them why, but there was a demon-possessed man on the other side of the lake that he wanted to go heal. And he says, let's get in the boat, and I want you to row me the other side. We've got something to do over there. And so Jesus is exhausted. And he goes and he lays in the stern of the boat, the back end of the boat, and he falls asleep. And halfway across the water, as they get halfway across the Sea of Galilee, a storm arises, and the Bible says that the waves were filling the boat. It's sinking. And the disciples are afraid. Seems like a natural reaction to me. And they go and they wake up Jesus and they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? The boat is filling up with water. Wake up and do something. And Jesus gets up and wipes the sleep out of his eyes and he stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves and immediately they become calm. And then he turned to the disciples, probably irritated they woke him up. And he goes, and it, the Bible says he rebukes them. And he says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And that's kind of the end of that story. And I think I could relate to the disciples. If I was, now by the way, these disciples, they were fishermen, they grew up on the Sea of Galilee. When it says that the waves were filling the boat, that boat must have been sinking for them to be afraid. Like genuinely, the trial was on. And isn't it true that when you're going through a trial and death is at your doorstep, the natural reaction is, I'm afraid. That's the natural reaction. It's, how, it's who we are. We can all say that. We're, we all get afraid when that happens. But yet God wants to calibrate our thinking and he goes, I know you're afraid, but now trust me. And he wants to calibrate that fear and he wants to turn it into faith. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I asked myself, well, God, what did you expect from the disciples? I mean, the boat's full of water, Lord. It's sinking. What did you expect them to do? And the answer comes to me. This is what I think the Lord would say to him. He'd say, I expect you to trust me. I expect you to bail and bail quickly because it's filling. And I expect you to keep rowing. Get to the other side like I told you to. So if you're going through a trial today, here's what I believe God says to us for those of us that are really going through it. Trust him, bail and row. Just don't give up. Keep going. He told you to go to the other side. Go to the other side. Get through it. Amen. The second thing is, is that in the trial... He corrects the course of my life. The second half of verse 4 says, um, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, the word comfort there is a little different than I thought because I thought comfort was more like my wife feeding me chocolate chip cookies and scratching my bed, no, scratching my head and tickling my back and doing that. You know, I, that's what I thought comfort was, but that's not what it is. The word comfort there, it actually means to sigh, to breathe heavy, to be sorry or to repent. When we go through the trial, the Lord never wastes a good trial. He's correcting the course of our life. And if there's something there that he just needs to correct, he's going to do that in that trial. Now, I thought about that aside. What is aside? Because I do that all the time. I'm at work and I just, <sighs> I'll do it in the truck. LB goes, what's wrong? Hm, nothing. I mean, I, sometimes I do it. I don't even realize I'm doing it. Well, when I looked it up, it's an expression of resignation and frustration. You're just resigning. That's what God wants from us. The next time, does anybody else sigh or am I like a weird one? People do that, right? I mean, that's like a normal thing. I do it all the time. And I determine the next time that happens, I'm going to think this thought. And I hope I want to encourage you with it. The next time you let out that, I'm going to let it spur this. God, I resign my problems to you. They're yours and yours alone to, to handle. God never expected us to carry heavy burdens. He says, cast all your cares on me for I care for you. He wants to carry our burden. He's there for that. Our great shepherd wants to carry our burden. Interesting that it says his rod and his staff. The staff was an instrument of affection. Because there was a crook in it, he could take a sheep and draw them in close. Have you ever been reading the scripture, and maybe you read a, a passage of scripture a thousand times, and now you're going through something in your life, and you read this passage of scripture, and this verse comes off the page, it brings you to your knees and tears and you go, God, I've never seen that before. And it just ministers to you in the moment. Or maybe you come to church and you're here and we've sang a song a hundred times and your hands are raised and just all of a sudden, the words of this song are speaking to you. That's God drawing you in with his staff, drawing you close, just ministering to you and loving you and caring for you, correcting the course of your life through just expressing love. Now, if you're a a compliant sheep and you go with that God will always correct you that way but if you're a rebellious sheep as some of us can be God's got a rod too the shepherd carried a rod and the rod if a sheep was constantly rebellious the shepherd would go and he would strike that sheep in the legs sometimes breaking the legs and he'd pick that sheep up and he'd put it over his shoulders we always see that picture and we think oh how cute he's carrying the sheep he just broke the sheep's legs that's why he's carrying it but he'll carry that sheep. And that sheep during that time is completely reliant upon the shepherd. He, the shepherd's got to feed him. He has to give him water. He's going to feel the shepherd's heartbeat. He's going to hear his voice and know his voice. And so even in those times of discipline, and we all go through it, even in the times of discipline, the intention is, is for God to draw us closer to him if we allow him to do so. 
The final thing I want to share with you this morning, I couldn't wait to get to this, is during the trial, the victory is mine. Psalms 23, verse 5 and 6. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That right there is really powerful. Don't take the verse off, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish the verses, but you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. If you're going through a trial, you know what I'm about to say. It feels like there is an enemy around every corner and they're constantly coming at you. And yet it says, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemy. How can I eat at a table unless I have peace to know that God's got my back? You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. They haven't switched it yet. There they go. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I told you in the beginning that these psalms were all prophetic. And Psalms 22 spoke of Christ's death. Psalms 23 speaks of our life currently in Christ. And as Psalms 22 speaks of his death, and Psalms 23, where we're reading this, talks about this table that he prepares for us, what table would that be other than the communion table? I wish we had time for communion this morning because I feel like it could really drive home the point, but I talk too much. We just didn't have that much time for communion. But think about the communion table. When we come to communion, Jesus says, as often as you partake of this cup and drink, eat this bread and partake of this cup and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. We do it in remembrance of the work that he did on the cross. Now, with that thought in mind, I want to take you to Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Because this is the work that Jesus did on the cross. This is the victory that he gives us through dying on the cross and raising from the dead. In him, speaking of Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, the fullness of the Godhead, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the fullness of it dwelt in Christ in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. You've been justified. He's declared you righteous. He sees you as the completed project. You've been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him... You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's speaking about the sanctification process where he removes the calluses of our life and he exposes a, a brand new heart in us as he changes us. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith through the working of God who raised him from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is working in you and I to change us and to make us more like him. If he could resurrect Jesus from the dead, he could resurrect this person and make me more like Christ. When you were, when, sorry, my contacts are, they did it last service too. When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcised, <laughs> I just got to laugh at myself. <laughs> Uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of our transgressions. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And I want you to leave this verse up, if you will. <clears throat> when he had disarmed all rulers and authorities. That's different rankings of demonic spirits. He disarmed rulers and authorities and he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through it. The words public display, display and triumph, I want to share with you what those words mean. The word public display, when a king in the Old Testament would conquer a kingdom, he would take that surviving king and whatever other soldiers they might have captured that they didn't kill, <clears throat> and even the people that they captured, and they would take that king and they would cut his thumbs off. They would cut his big toes off. They would strip him naked and run him through the streets. That's what Jesus did to demonic forces in our life. Is he cut his, their thumbs off, their toes off, stripped them naked, and he's parading them through the streets naked. Why would he do that? Or why would they even reference this? Why would they say Jesus did this to the, our enemy? Because by cutting the thumbs off, our enemy can no longer hold a sword against us. 
No weapon formed against you shall prosper, <coughs> nor any plague come near your dwelling place. The enemy can't hold the sword against you by cutting the toes off. He can no longer re resist you from your advancement towards walking towards Christ. He, he can't resist you in battle any longer. The devil can't. And by stripping him naked, it exposed him so that you no longer have to be intimidated by the enemy. And it says, having triumphed over them through it. The word triumph, it's a noisy procession of worship. And it comes from a root word, which means to trouble or to frighten. As we go through trials in life, the Lord has prepared this table in the presence of our enemies. And we can sit and we can sit in peace and partake of that table, knowing that, yes, we see the enemies all around us, but they can't hold a sword against us. They can't advance against us. Jesus disarmed my enemy. He, he set me free. And as I began to worship the Lord through song, I placed Jesus in his proper position in my life. And it re-centers him where he needs to be in my life. And when I worship the Lord, I place him as my great shepherd. I give him that spot in my life so that he has the victory. And I recognize that he's in control. And I surrender myself to him. And I sit at the table of the work that he did at the cross. And I hold on to his promises that he gave me because he died for me on the cross. I can hold on to those promises and I could partake of what God gives to me. Let's pray. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the message. And I would just like to invite you to share that with as many people or one person that you think just might need that. Because not only do we want the Bible to be truthful, which it is, we want it to be useful. And we try to make it as practical as possible for me, for you, and for any friends that we have, especially those far from Jesus that might need that. And another thing too you can do is you can now subscribe to the New Beginnings YouTube channel so that when these messages are archived, it'll pop up and let you know it's there. And you can go back and watch that or once again, share it with somebody else. So we just hope you have a blessed day. Once again, hope this thing ministered to you and look forward to seeing you again soon.